Our first session, the panel discussion for the day is uh, on future of mobile, cloud, and that thing called Internet of Things. The panel is led by Sri Sridharan, the Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Florida Center for Cybersecurity, managing offices worldwide. His experience in the IT field spans software, hardware, networks, and mobile platform. His leadership enabled ServiceNet to become the leading global application service provider, ASP, with eight data centers worldwide. More recently, he established a new business unit, Solution Services for Stratus Technologies, and grew it to $25 million in revenue in less than four years. Recently, he served as the chairman of Tampa Bay Technology Forum. Mr. Sridharan has three master's degrees in applied mathematics, mathematics and computer science. Thank you for joining the panel. In the interest of time, if you would please hold your applause till all the speakers come upstairs. Mark Swanson, entrepreneur and vice president, Bright House Networks, is a serial entrepreneur who has successfully started and grown six multi-million dollar businesses Thank you, Mark. over the last 21 years. Most recently, Mark was the CEO of Tampa-based Televisions, a two-time Inc. 500 company, which he co-founded in 2006 and sold to Bright House Networks in 2012. Mark bootstrapped his first business while transitioning out of the Army and has subsequently raised over $70 million in venture capital to launch technology companies in Atlanta, Silicon Valley, and Tampa Bay. Mark started his career in the United States Army, where he led several military units, including forming the first unit of Apache attack helicopters. He graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point with a degree in computer engineering and holds a Master's of Science in Technology Management from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Our third uh, panel expert is Raj Tuleti, founder and president of Coordinated Care Solutions at Patient Point. Raj Tuleti oversees the company's growth strategies and marketing position, market positioning. Previously, he founded Galvanon, a technology company focused on improving the patient experience, which was acquired by NCR in 2005. While at Galvanon, Tuleti oversaw the introduction of the first, first commercially available patient self-service kiosk and software platform to automate patient check-in and intake processes at hospitals and physician offices. Prior to that, Tuleti was the founder of Saitura Corporation, a content management company that was acquired by Mobius in 2002. He was also a founding member of the Microsoft Consulting Services Healthcare Practice, where he was awarded the Excellence Award for Consulting from Microsoft. He has come here all the way from Orlando to join us. Our next panelist is Matt Galvin, CTO of Carvoyant. Matt executes product development and oversees internal technology infrastructure for Carvoyant, a startup that provides the backend tools that help developers and businesses alike to take advantage of the opportunities that a connected car promises to deliver. Prior to Carvoyant, he served at the, as the enterprise architect for, an, for a company providing background checks to a range of industries. His past experience includes e-commerce startups. Matt has a BS in computer science and a BS in computer engineering from the University of South Florida. Some of us know Matt as a triathlete, a glass blower, and a mentor who teaches kids to code at Coder Dojo Tampa Bay Area. It's a free volunteer program. Our next panelist is Karthik Vishwanathan, he's the president of Convene Inc. Bootstrapped this information technology company with the goal of providing exceptional plan focused solutions. In its first year in 2006, Convene's revenue was about $60,000, but that grew to 10 million in 2013. And Convene now employs about 70 people in the United States and India, not including contractors. Okay, thanks. Ah, she will take the podium, yeah. And, uh, the company was also recognized. So Convene has plans nationwide. Its success has been recognized by Inc. 5000, where the company ranked at 430 nationally, but number six in the Tampa Bay area. The company was also recognized locally by Tampa Bay Business Journal's annual Fast 50, which is awarded to companies exhibiting rapid growth. Karthik is involved in a variety of charities, such as St. Jude's Hospice, and serves as a charter member of TIE. Thank you very much.
morning, everyone. You all awake? Just want to make sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to moderate this panel this morning. We've got some exciting discussion that's going to take place in the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, the topic is the future of mobile, cloud, and IoT, Internet of Things. That's a new buzzword in case you didn't know. It makes for good conversations at 3.30 in the bar. Um, there's a certain level of convergence that's taking place across these different technologies as well. When, you come to, when it comes to mobile, everything is going mobile. Now you, have to, you can deposit your check by taking a picture of it and sending it to your bank. Uh, you can do payment transactions. You can do all kinds of searches. Everything is going mobile. But you know, somebody is not thinking about how well protected is this whole mobile architecture. And when it comes to cloud, same types of questions are being asked. Where is my data really residing? How secure is my data? These are all questions that are being asked by CTOs and CIOs who want to take a decision to outsource to some entity to take care of all the cloud offerings. Uh, Internet of Things, that's a huge, evolving, new stuff that everybody is talking about. And as manager of managing director of the Cybersecurity Center at Florida, uh, Florida, Florida Center for Cybersecurity at USF, uh, I get a lot of information on all of these issues and technologies. We have assembled a fantastic panel this morning. You heard the introductions. And the way we'll structure this is I would like each panel member to speak for a couple of minutes about their specific areas of uh, technology that they use in their companies. And then I'll ask one or two leading questions, and then I want the audience to ask the majority of the questions. So that's how we will structure it. Is that okay? All right, with that, I'm gonna let Karthik lead and make some statements. Thanks. Uh, Karthik, I run a software services company here in Tampa called Convene. Uh, what we do is we help companies uh, adopt and thrive in this converged digital world. Um, among other things, we focus on uh, cloud computing, enterprise mobility, um, helping companies uh, adopt the cloud, migrate to the cloud, architect for the cloud. Um, we also take mobility and, and uh, approach it from the standpoint of enterprises. Um, how, how are enterprises actually going to use mobile applications, uh, staff-facing mobile apps? How do, you, how do you manage them? How do you secure them? Uh, those are some of the areas of interest for us. Uh, sort of nicely dovetails into this emerging uh, uh, Internet of Things uh, that we're going to talk about today. Thanks. Hello, I'm uh, Mark Swanson, and uh, my uh, background, I consider myself really a technology entrepreneur, and I, I look at uh, technology and how it can be used uh, and to change uh, things. Uh, I think that our, our keynote speech talked about that. And if you look at the Internet of Things, mobile and cloud, my perspective really goes back 40 years. I have a very uh, distinct memory in the early 70s when I was uh, in seventh or sixth grade and uh, walking into my father's office. He was a mathematics uh, professor or, or teacher in high school. And I saw really what I would probably say the first mobile device or uh, Internet of Things device, and that was a calculator by, by Sharp. And it, I was amazed at that, and, and I had an epiphany. And as I played with that device, I said, I'm never going to have to take math again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was sorely mis mistaken. Fortunately, I did take math. But if you look back over those last 40 years, uh, technology has come in waves, and back then it was the, the PC was, was, you know, no one even knew about it. Uh, jobs had not come around, and, and Bill Gates had not thought of the software yet, but we, we entered that uh, revolution where PCs became uh, everyday appliances. That was a big wave, uh, and I started my, my first uh, business at the end of that wave. Uh, that business was not uh, successful, but uh, fortunately I was able to to kind of re regroup and start at what I saw was the big, uh, the second big wave of uh, technology, which was the internet. And, and there's waves within those waves, you know, things like uh, web, you know, web 2.0, like social media. Now we got web 3.0. Uh, 
Um, but I, I really see this next wave of Internet of Things as being a major wave and probably a great opportunity for thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs. Um, we are now entering an age where there's so many more connected devices than people. Um, and you look at how we're going to manage all those, secure all those, I think uh, this is where uh, my current company, Bright House Networks, I'm spending a lot of my time there um, figuring out how do we uh, apply those technologies, uh, standardize those technologies, because I think standardization is a huge uh, thing, and then uh, also secure those technologies so they can be used uh, for, for very beneficial things instead of for, uh, for evil, like Google says, don't be evil. Um, so that's really where our focus is at, at Bright House, is, is providing those, uh, the, the ability to manage all the new technologies coming out, provide them with bandwidth, uh, standardize your platform, and then do great things uh, for your business on that platform. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> My name is Raj Shaleri. Thank you for having me here. I'm a big fan of Tesh, and it's always a pleasure uh, hearing him speak. Um, I have to tell you this. Uh, yesterday, when I was preparing for what I was going to say about Internet of Things, my eight-year-old son was actually looking at me and checking out Internet of Things. He said, like, Dad, I know that. I got thing one, thing two, and thing three, right? So there's so many variations of what we define these things to be. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm all about healthcare. Today, my perspective is all going to be about healthcare. I come from a family of 26 doctors. My parents, my grandparents, I got, my mom's got eight siblings, they're all doctors, their spouses are doctors, their kids are doctors. So the only person that's not a doctor in my family is me and my little brother who makes Bollywood movies. So we have a lot of fun actually. <laughs> so we have a lot of fun uh, when we go to our family settings. But when you think about cloud computing, when you think about Internet of Things, and when you think about mobility in healthcare, and when you think about social entrepreneurship, when you think about population health, it's an exciting space to be in. So I look forward to uh, talking about all of these topics, and thank you again. <clears throat> Thanks, Raj. Uh, my name is Matt Galvin. I'm the CTO for Carvoyant. Um, similar to what Mark said, basically my entire life has been around connecting things online. Um, I think I was maybe eight the first time I took apart my Atari and got yelled at by my mom. You know, a, a few years ago, I bought a house and built a fish tank in there, and the very first time I had the equipment turned on, the first thing that came to mind was, can I track my fish online? And the family really didn't get that, but it's, it's really been the essence of my entire career, is taking things in the physical world and putting them online and put, making them digital, doing some really cool things with it. Um, at Carvoyant, our focus is the connected car, so taking your vehicle and effectively making it a, a digital asset. When I first started it, my son asked me what I was doing, and, and when I explained to him, his response was, well, Dad, that's completely impossible because there's no way you can put a satellite inside of your car so that your computer can talk to it. But really, that's what we've done. Um, so I'm really interested to see over the next couple of years how the things that are tangible objects in the real world that we don't necessarily think about being a part of our kind of online identity really begins to take that presence. Um, the panel here is a very discreet, um, we have our own industries that we work in. We did a call earlier this week. Kind of the running theme was, why are all four of us on this panel? Because it, it really wasn't clear how we related to each other, but I think there is a lot of overlap um, in the different industries that we work in, and I'm really interested to hear what everybody has to say. Thank you. So let me lead off with the first question. Um, somebody want to define Internet of Things and how it's going to make life any better for us? Anyone? I, I told you about my some things, but uh, <laughs> so Internet of Things, if you, if you look at it from a healthcare perspective, uh, when a patient gets admitted uh, into an emergency department, 98% of the time, uh, the, the emergency room does not have your medical records. And not only do they not have your medical records, but they also do not know who your primary care physician is. This internet of things, <clears throat> when you actually touch something and, and then call for an ambulance, that same thing can actually initiate a transaction to your primary care physician, and actually the same thing can help 
the emergency room, get your records. So the, to, 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 in the healthcare space, when you're talking about population health management, and there are different types of populations, underserved populations, uh, very affluent populations. So how we can actually bring change and fundamental behavior change so that you can empower these patients and connect them to their providers and their caregivers in, in a much more meaningful fashion. We believe Internet of Things and certain things which are securely connected, because in healthcare, I've seen there's a lot of data that can float around and there's, there's a lot of security issues. There are challenges, but there is significant opportunity around these things that can be connected to change lives, truly. Anyone else wants to comment on it? So, uh, I, would, I would define uh, the Internet of Things as, a, as an ecosystem. Uh, where you have these bunch of things that are interconnected uh, can uh, communicate and uh, they're uniquely identifiable, that's the key thing, right? Uh, that sort of begs the question, what is a thing? Uh, really, anything is a thing. Uh, today you have cell phones connected to the internet, you have your uh, home security devices. In the future, you're going to have your, your cars, your airplanes, uh, could even be your pets and your humans, right? I mean, you have chips in, embedded in pets, um, pacemakers in, in humans that can uh, that can connect over the internet. Um, the, the key is that that these devices are able to communicate among themselves, share information, and potentially act on act on this information on their own. Uh, that sort of sets the stage for what what an Internet of Things is. To give you an idea, uh, today almost all the data or information on the internet has been uh, created by humans for human consumption. But in the next evolution with 4.0, it's going to be a combination of information that's generated by humans for humans and, and by other devices and machines for other machines. So that sort of gives you an idea, I hope, of what an internet of things is. Yeah, I think one uh, big th thing that's going to change with the Internet of Things uh, is we are going to move from a world of the discrete to the world of the continuous. We live our lives uh, continuously. We, you know, we, our, the system, the, the uh, neighborhoods that we live in, our human body, our cars, they all emit data continuously. And today, we are basically waiting for things to happen to ourselves. So when we go get our checkup at the doctor, we're basically giving them uh, one point in time in that year, really ignoring the entire effect of what's happened to us and how we um, have responded over a cycle uh, over that year. Same thing goes for our car. We wait for it to break down, then we take it in. But once we move into this world of co the continuous, we are able to open up an entire uh, set of possibilities and in, in change, changes in the management paradigm and the way we do things. So no longer do we have to wait for our car to break down. Our car will let us know uh, through the internet of things when it's ready to, you know, to drive in there and, and get that nail taken out of your tire that you don't know that's there or, or replace your carburetor or from a when you're about to have a heart attack so you can go in and, and get that fixed um, instead of finding out um, on the operating room table that uh, you have coronary artery disease. So it's really going to open up a whole new set of possibilities, that, which is why I think it's really the next uh, big wave in, in the way things are going. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the challenges, I think, as, as an IoT company, which is what Carvoland frames ourselves as, is showing real value to people who use it. And I, I think the problem that companies in the IoT space have had is we tend to focus on the one particular or two particular things that we're connecting. But the real value of the Internet of Things is not the thing, it's the Internet part of it. It's the, the relations between the information that your car is collecting and that maybe your heart monitor is collecting and maybe the external weather station is reporting and helping avoid a car accident five miles down the road. So as we start collecting all of this data and we're getting into the world of really big data, not big data as we thought it was, what's going to be important is looking at the relationships between those different types of things that we're collecting data, not the individual things on their own. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think you, you heard a few examples of heart attacks, car accidents, etc. On a positive note, uh, the, an example that I can give you also is that you leave your office and your car lets your house know that you're coming, checks the traffic and says you'll be there in 20 minutes, cools the house down if you're in Tampa, and then starts your crock pot so that your stew can be ready by the time you get there to eat. Internet of things. So another example. Um, audience, do you have any question? Yes, please go to the mic. So I can get how, as a large company, I just luckily came off a project where we're looking at how to help advance computing, help large companies utilize the Internet of Things and compute all the data coming in. I understand as a consumer how it can help. But what I'm wondering is, for most of us who are dealing with and supporting smaller businesses, what is it that, what are ideas that, and I think, Karthik, you might be the best position to answer this. How is it that smaller enterprises, you know, of 50 or 100 people or 10 people might be able to actually think about how IoT can power competitive advantage when you aren't the owner of giant data sets or you don't necessarily have the ability to create the connectivity, but you, you have the ability to take maybe a $10,000 budget or a $20,000 or $30,000 budget over a couple of years. How could you guys see small businesses like the ones that we have in support building competitive advantage out of IoT? Great question. So, so if you think about it, like you rightly said, it's all about the data, right? So there's going to be a huge amount of data that's collected. The question is, what can you do with it? And how quickly can you do something with it? For small companies, well, let's talk about let's talk about the trends in general, right? Market, the industry is moving towards a market of one. So if you have the ability to sell and market and service a, a market of one, an individual customer, that has great value. So data is available. If you can find ways to dissect the data in real time, or even over a, over a continuum, and you're able to provide service to individuals to a market of one, then you're a step above your competition right, right off the bat. And I think in and of things, with, with this large stream of data, you, you're going to be able to do that. Whether it is uh, information that you're collecting about your customer behavior, in a, in a exactly right. Uh, so you're not targeting your your Tampa Bay market in general, but you're targeting someone as granular as living in a you know around the corner from your house. Now, as spooky as it may sound, it's not it, 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 it's it, it's it's not that far from reality to me. Um, so I, I think small businesses would can tremendously benefit by targeting their dollars towards uh, specific uh, opportunities that so that they can maximize their ROI. I certainly see that as one one way where you know the Internet of Things is going to help small businesses. Um, okay. I think it's like an unbelievably huge opportunity because um, big businesses spend most of their time in meetings. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, I spent about 20, 25 years uh, starting and um, leading companies, and Bright House is actually the first company that I've been a part of, and probably the biggest thing I note, uh, noted is how much uh, time uh, my peers spend in meetings. I really try to avoid meetings, because um, I think you can get more stuff done. And if you look in, in the future, there, the Internet of Things is going to generate an onslaught of data. And the big companies just don't have time to analyze all this and understand the relationships that that data can bring to the table and how it can affect your organization. Um, a good example of um, a company that, um, while this isn't quite the Internet of Things, uh, I, one of my... Um, my VP of sales at Televasions is now running a company called Kite Desk. It's a startup here. And they generate and analyze data from all your social networks. And it's literally just a plug-in. And we put that in Bright House. Um, and it's now on about 200 people's desktops. And it's generating all kinds of data 
um, that we're mining different relationships on uh, that we would have never had the ability to do because uh, Bright House, uh, we installed Salesforce.com a couple years ago when we when we came uh, became a part of that company. But that's gen with that all that data, we're gleaning great new insights that are saving our salespeople uh, tons of time and mining relationships and and our business services unit where we installed this uh, uh, Salesforce.com and using this data. Um, is that is really the results of that. We're accelerating our, our growth on top of a, a very high number that we actually didn't think we could meet. So I think a lot of that is a result of that increased efficiency that we're deriving because a small, you know, four or five person startup has come in and, and used the data that we already have to change the trajectory of our, our top line number. I think Internet of Things is definitely for small companies and startups. I can give you like 50 ideas in healthcare where you can actually really change, like truly change the lives of uh, so many people. Okay, uh, but I have to tell you this, I mean, in terms of security, uh, while I was driving here, uh, <clears throat> my brother-in-law was telling me, yeah, I can hack into my neighbor's um, camera, I can see their security feed. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> so, so think about that, right? Just think about that. You can actually hack into your neighbor's network. You can probably hack into your neighbor's fridge in the future. Right? <laughs> My fridge got hacked. <laughs> so, so I think, I think as much there is opportunity for small companies to go quickly, be agile, and solve problems. So in the Internet of Things, in healthcare, we see in the population health management space a number of use cases that small companies can innovate, capture that marketplace very effectively. It's, uh, we just don't have the time today, but definitely have a ton of ideas that we can we can discuss. Thank you. So I am the small company, probably the smallest of the four that are represented up here. Um, I have two partners. We have three founders. There's five employees in the company total. So really doesn't get much smaller than, than what we are right now. We are building a company providing IoT data. Um, we use a number of cloud services to keep our expenses under control. So in terms of building a startup in the IoT space, it's the right time to do it. Um, Service-based infrastructures, clearly we can build a company around it without massive capital investments. From a consumer of that data perspective, um, a lot of our customers right now are smaller, smaller organizations. And from them, if they look at trying to get vehicle information, which is what we provide, there is no way that they could build that infrastructure to collect that data on their own. But since we've done it and we're planning for you know, volume, large scale, we can offer the access to that information, very reasonable cost, very easy accessibility, handling things like security and data control and privacy. They don't have to worry about it. So small companies that want to consume IoT type data, it's the perfect environment for them. It lets them get access to massive data sets without the expense of collecting that data themselves. Thank you, great answers. Uh, Raj, just to uh, expand on a couple of things that you said, if, if a gadget has an IP address, it can be hacked. That's my universal uh, statement that I made. Uh, I'd say an IP address is not required for that. <laughs> no, but I said if it has, can be had. Um, another question? Please, go to the mic. Thank you. Um, Raj, going off your point, uh, what is being done as far as uh, creating the cybersecurity infrastructure around uh, the Internet of Things? I mean, every week I feel like I'm getting an email from Home Depot or someone else saying all your data is out there. Um, and a second related question is, what do, you, what do you guys think about the privacy surrounding the Internet of Things? The, the literature I've seen so far says that it predicts that we as a society will just get used to having all of our data out there flowing in the web. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that's the case, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts about that. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start with the healthcare piece because you probably read in the news. Uh, community health systems, the largest health system in the country, uh, lost millions of records. And right on the heels of that came Home Depot. Thank God for that. And they, moved the, they, they took the attention of the healthcare guy and didn't focus on the retail guy. But let me tell you something about healthcare. You know, all my fellow panelists have been talking about, you know, 
car breaking down, the car actually you know, telling the house to cool down. How many of you guys have actually gotten a phone call from your physician saying that your annual physical is due? Wow, I'm impressed. I'd like to meet your doctor actually. Now your, your car maintenance, you get a call, right? I mean, you, you get a call from everybody else, but your physician has no idea, right? They have no idea of how to actually manage your health. But in terms of security, we're building all these systems to secure the data. So I'll actually answer the question directly in one way, but also tell you that healthcare, even though we have so many advances in other industries, healthcare is far behind in terms of their technology, electronic medical records, so they're catching up. But security is actually very, very key in healthcare. So there's actually a lot of work being done to secure data at different layers. So in your electronic health record, a lot of patients are now carrying a lot of information on their phones, on their devices. So through digital signatures, through certificates, there's a, a whole set of solutions that are evolving so that we can actually feel somewhat you know, safe about our health data residing in certain data centers, in certain areas. So you as consumers will start to understand where is it safe to actually store my healthcare information and where it is not. And again, like, you know, if there's an IP address, you can hack it. So then it's not like it's, it's, there's a silver bullet and it's foolproof, but you want to be more and more aware of security around your health data over the next two years. And there's a number of solutions that are coming. So I, I got I think that's a major concern that the whole privacy security thing, particularly for some people that are doing illegal things. Um, how many people have uh, iPhones here? Um, probably most of most of the group. All right, so I'm I'm gonna make a prediction. I, iOS uh, eight, which just came out, has a, a huge uh, change in philosophy and architecture that is going to allow what I would. Well, probably will become known to is, is the personal cloud. I don't know if that term is out there. But what iOS 8 uh, does as an operating system is it, your apps today, they all work by um, taking your, collecting your data, like if you're doing wearables, I'm wearing a wearable right now, and it takes the data, it sends it to the cloud, and then uh, that, the cloud layer is where that data is exchanged iOS 8 has required uh, developers to, uh, not required them, but allowed developers to open up their applications to share data within the iPhone. So if you want to keep your personal health data aggregated and collected, it can be um, amalgamated, so to speak, in, on the iPhone, encrypted on the iPhone, and then sent up to the cloud in an unreadable format. So you can manage your life and all your Internet of Things devices that are, are collected via Bluetooth to your iPhone and then store that in an AES-256 encrypted uh, blob in the cloud. Therefore, it, you know, that data um, is no longer, it's personal, it's your personal cloud. So I think there, uh, most people don't know about this change. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with the head of healthcare last week out at Apple for Apple Health and, and he explained how that's the way Apple is, going to, is viewing how it's going to secure all this personal data that it's collecting on your health. Is that, is that for the browser-based browser inflow flows or is that for all? It's for app inflow flows, yes, app. Mac, you want to comment on that? So as consumers, we're going to need to make the decision if we work with companies that are warehousing that kind of information. Um, to some extent, it's going to be out of our control. Um, certainly specific to cars, which I, I know the most about. Um, within the next couple of years, the vehicles are going to be collecting data regardless of whether you want them to. And it's going to be reporting back to the manufacturers regardless of whether you want it to. So effectively, your only choice is ride a bike or accept the, the data. You know, I'm a triathlete, so I'll go ride a bike. But um, I think what becomes a challenge for us, you know, to speak to, to the solution that Mark presented, the problem is that that's still a fairly closed ecosystem and ultimately I want to send that information to, you know, my doctor's office and I have no idea what system my doctor's office is using. So once it leaves my kind of personal cloud, it's out in the wild. Um, what's going to become, I think, an interesting part of kind of the social discussions that start to occur is 
what we allow as acceptable use of that data. I mean, there's always going to be the edge cases of you know some nefarious use, somebody hacked in and stole my data. But just as importantly, it's going to be what are things that we let um, legal entities use? What are our insurance companies allowed to use? What are our employers allowed to use? Uh, and and the, the analysis of that data, what's okay for it to do? If I have a heart rate monitor on and I'm driving my car and I know the weather conditions are, are poor, do we allow for, I don't know, dynamic speed limits? Now all of a sudden you're speeding even though the sign says that you're allowed to be going that fast. Uh, so I think it's going to become more of a social issue rather than a technical issue uh, around the data. Thank you. Next question. Good morning. So I've been in technology since the mid-80s as well. I am fascinated with all the improvements that we've had, but also I really want to live. I want to be a human being. I don't want to be overwhelmed with serving my technology. So what do you see that the Internet of Things can provide for me to live freely without having to serve my car and serve my Fitbit and serve the quantification of my life? How will I continue to have a happy human life? I'm going to take a, a first pass at answering that, and I'm going to do one that has absolutely nothing to do with the car. Uh, so, uh, my son is nine, and, and we've recently started allowing him to lock up the house this morning and walk to the neighborhood school in the morning. And we're now maybe a month and a half into the school year, and I've gotten a phone call at two o'clock in the afternoon, probably four times now that the garage door was left open. Um, I expect that's going to continue. It'll probably happen again next week. So when we do talk about things like Internet of Things and, and starting to connect physical assets in the real world to our kind of online presence, that can solve my garage door problem. My car can, or my house can know that nobody's in the house and at nine o'clock during Monday through Friday, if the garage door's open, make sure nothing's blocking it, close the garage door for me. So when we talk about how the Internet of Things can help our lives and, and enrich the things that are going on without becoming a burden, I think it becomes more of a, a passive behind the scenes. These are the things that should happen. My alarm should be on if none of my cars are there. You know, if, if something's going wrong from a, from a medical perspective, maybe contact my doctor behind the scenes and send them that information. And then my doctor can contact me if it's something I really need to care about. So I think that's where the benefit of IoT is going to become, is, is kind of this background monitoring of our lives and helping handle and resolve issues before they happen. Anyone else wants to comment on that question? It's fine. Oh, okay. Any other questions? We've got time for one more question. Please. Clearly the shortest person in the room. <laughs> um, I've worked with big, big amounts of data for most of my career, um, grocery purchase data specifically, and I know that data is only worth the use case that drives revenue uh, against it. So I'm wondering if you guys can speak to, in this area of the Internet of Things, um, what kinds of use cases and, and how disciplined are you or would you recommend people be in designing the use cases that actually unlock the value of the data all those things are going to generate? <coughs> I'll start with that one, I guess. Um, the sky's really the limit when it comes to use cases for data in our lives. Um, we have kind of the recurring theme of my answers has been this passive monitoring of things within our lives. Um, but certainly, when we start looking at things like grocery shopping data or um, car purchasing data or hobby information, the, um, the, the pervasiveness of, of all of that information is really going to, um, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Uh, repeat your question for me again, I'm sorry. Given the importance of the use case, data right, right, right. is value as an asset, but value is a function of the use case. Sure, so, okay, so different industries are gonna have different things that they want to accomplish from that information, whether it's safety, whether it's insurance, whether it's uh, buying new information, buying new, new products. So. The use cases for the first time, certainly in, in my life, are not going to be limited by the information that's available. Um, you know, if, if I want to, I can put an RFID sensor on this class and I can do something with it. And if I'm in a, a 
if I'm a glass blower and I want to know, does it sit down the wrong way, IoT can help me with that. So I think the use cases really are, are effectively unlimited. It's just a matter of how much information a consumer is willing to share with whatever service is being provided. You know, I don't think so. the use cases here are any different. So uh, when I first introduced the check-in system in healthcare or the airline kiosk, all we did was print a boarding card or uh, just a very few things we did for check-in. Today you can uh, sign up for uh, clinical trials, you can change your seat, you can do a bunch of things. <clears throat> so finding those use cases, because at the end of the day, like Desh was saying, you're trying to solve a problem. <coughs> And if you're doing the same thing, you're going to expect the same result. So pick those use cases that you can actually truly solve and create some disruption, right? So if, if for your health, right, you need to know certain things and certain use cases. So all, we are picking very simple, effective use cases to solve in the Internet of Things, and it's going to evolve. I mean, that, that's the general guidance I'll give you, but I can give you industry-specific use cases that we are picking up. I think one of the uh, biggest benefits of the Internet of Things is that you can pick the use cases that matter uh, most to you based on where you are in your life. So if you, for example, um, have a health condition like diabetes, um, and, uh, and I personally have a, a situation where my father has diabetes, he also has Alzheimer's, so we are able to use uh, the Internet of Things, basically a, a glucometer that's attached to the Internet to look at his blood levels and then call him up to remind him um, to check those, uh, those blood levels. And that's a really good use case and that's what, what matters if you have a, in healthcare, if you have a particular disease, if you have a, a car that you're, um, you know, you want to do traffic because you, you're in a city that is constantly congested, I think, uh, the you know Waze is a great example of how we've collected that data and and allow you to to do those things. But I think those use cases, based on the stage of your life, um, whether it and, and the condition that you have, um, are going to really and, and this is going back to the previous question. It's going to allow you to free up your time to better manage uh, those con those situations that need continuous management. You're right, it's all about the data. Uh, but more importantly, it's about using the data in, in the context that, that, that the person is in and as quickly as you can. So if you're at a Publix and you're out there shopping and you spent uh, five minutes in the baby food aisle, does it make sense to send Karthik a coupon to buy Gerber baby food at that particular instant? There is value to that for Gerber, there's value to that for public services. So um, the, the possibilities are endless, it's all about data, but how quickly can you act on this real-time stream of data and understanding the context where this data is being generated and taking advantage of it. I'll go back to the statement I made earlier, it's a market, ultimately I see this as the, mar the market for um, companies uh, your target market is, is shrinking, not in the sense of who you sell to, but how you target your customers. It's all about service. Can you service and provide excellent service to that one particular individual based on the data that you have? So, um, I think in that context, if you look at it, you can apply that to retail, you can apply that to healthcare, you can apply that to any, any specific industry out there. Knowing your customer better has tremendous value. Thank you. One last question. So coming back from the same context, the data you were talking about, um, especially in the healthcare field, uh, my question is, so when the source of data is, let's say, take an example of a patient entering his data on internet or a cloud, but the data he wants to send it to his doctor or his hospital. Now if he changes the hospital, he changes the doctor, that's where the data gets confused. Now, it's the data source is different. The data is supposed to go to one place. So who controls the data? Because he's not going to go into four different websites or four different software. There are thousands of softwares which are managing patient data. Same thing in different industries. 
So who is going to consolidate all of that at one place and ultimately who is going to own that data? I mean, that, that's a big question. But it's not like email, like you can still cross interchange communication. You can send the email to a different email provider. Here it's very difficult. It seems that you know, you're know you sharing the same information with different vendors, but so it seems like the same information is sitting at four different places. And so I hope basically you understand the question. Number one is who, who owns the data, who controls the data, or is it going to change? Is it going to consolidate at one place? I think Mark said it. I think Apple is going to own the data. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, it's actually you as the consumer and the patient own the data. Right. What the Internet of Things is going to enable you and empower you is carry your medical record. Okay, there is an initiative by the federal government. Uh, I sit on the board of UCF in Orlando. We have a grant from the state of Florida to do some population health management in very some underserved communities in, in, in the state of Florida, where uh, we, we are we're actually looking at. Uh, think I, I'm going to mix Internet of Things, mobile and cloud computing because that's it. So I'll give you one use case to kind of summarize this whole thing in healthcare. So there is a, 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 um, a cloud-based infrastructure that the federal government is mandating for clinical information exchange. It's called direct email addresses. So think about it. You think businesses have been dead. Who starts an email business this day and age? I'll tell you, there are quite a few. So there's a uh, it's called HISP, it's like a tech, it's, it's a protocol, it's a secure communication. So if you want to transmit your documents to Mark as your family member or your uh, subscribers, you can actually set up your own subscribers and do a direct communication. So there are small businesses that are being started up around cloud-based HISPs, right? So we are actually setting up a network of care providers that can actually see a patient's record in the state of Florida, no matter where they are. And in, 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 the, in Miami Children's Hospital, I mean, this is actually my fourth startup. It's a new company because what, what do entrepreneurs do? They just start companies. It's called Health Grid. So where every patient walking out of the emergency department gets a text message saying that, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, would you like your uh, discharge summary and your discharge instructions on your phone? Boom, yes. Now they can take it with them. We get 98% of the patients wanting their summaries on their phone as opposed to paper. They can carry it with them. They can transmit to their primary care. So we're creating this infrastructure where it's a point-to-point -point communication independent of the back-end electronic medical record. Will the Googles of the world, will the Apples of the world all set up these cloud-based systems and you as a consumer, you might like an Android device or an Apple device. But how do we kind of set you free as a consumer so that you can actually exchange this information between the things and between the devices? So I can keep talking about this for quite some time, but it's a great, you as the consumer are going to hold the data. It's actually, it's, it's almost like an EDI transaction. So, so it's yeah, ultimately you will own it, like if Mark's dad is diabetic, and if, how, if he could set up the glucometer to basically publish only to his family, then that's a secure glucometer, and that device is connected to the primary care physician, so then he, as the caretaker of his dad, can set up that thing on the internet so that it is meaningful for his ecosystem. So there are, a plenty of opportunities in the space for entrepreneurs like us to really be nimble and capture the, the opportunity. Mark, keep your comments to a minimum because we're running out of time. Well, I think absolutely the, the person has to own their own healthcare data, and it's the only way our future healthcare system is going to work. I don't know where uh, along the last 50 years where we have change the meaning of health insurance to meaning health care because that a vast majority or, or a vast number of people in the United States feel like it's not their responsibility to care for themselves or their loved ones. We now have the technology to, to take that responsibility. In my opinion, we can manage our own health care if we, if we care a lot better uh, than, than any doctor that can only spend 10 minutes uh, with you in the office can once a year. Thank you. Thank you very much.